Today we'll look at the system's development life cycle. We'll look at the software development life cycle in another video. The tricky thing to remember is that the SysP exam doesn't distinguish between the two. Yet there is a difference. The system life cycle can focus more on a physical thing, like a computer, a firewall, or a server, while the software life cycle focuses more on a piece of software code. The reason the SysP exam might not differentiate between the two is because they are really just high-level ways of maintaining the life of a system or a software. And the SysP is all about being a high-level exam. Life cycles are important because in each stage it allows us to think about and implement security along the way. And again, for the SysP exam, it's important to remember that security should be implemented not only at the very beginning, but along every stage along the way. There are no set and formal terms for each of the stages in an SDLC, whether it's system or software. But there is a general structure. For the video today, we'll look at the stages involved with the development of a system lifecycle. These stages include initiation and requirement stage, the planning and acquisition stage, the actual deployment stage, followed by the system in operations along with its maintenance, and finally the disposal stage. Let's begin with examples of each. The initiation and requirement stage has to answer two questions. What is the problem we face in the company that requires a new system and why this particular system would be best suited for this problem? Let's follow what could be a real life scenario within an enterprise company. We have a group of employees who wish to work from home every Friday. They ask their boss, hey boss, we all want to start working from home every Friday. The boss says, what? Why? Everybody has their reasons. No babysitter, lots of traffic, medical reasons, or just because everybody else is. We have now completed what could be considered the initiation phase. That wasn't so bad. At this point, the boss could immediately reject the idea without giving it any thought, and our system's development life cycle would be over before it even began. But this boss decides to give it some more thought. He says, let me talk to our SysP and conduct a preliminary risk assessment to see how it affects confidentiality, integrity, and availability of our internal information. A preliminary risk assessment is an extremely important process when it comes to security. It is a good way to identify the vulnerabilities that are associated with confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the cornerstone concept of information security. Whenever you approach a question on the SysP exam, try to first ask yourself if it's addressing either one of these three concepts and work from there. I promise it really helps. Always try to think about the CIA when dealing with security. Achieving a good balance between each part of the CIA provides for a better security posture for the company. Let's continue to see what the SysP has to say. Well, for confidentiality, we need to encrypt the data in motion and we'll need users working at home to be authenticated. We also need to maintain integrity of the data in motion so information cannot be changed by an attacker. And for availability, we'll need two, just in case one fails. The boss now has an idea of what is needed to uphold the CIA of security. And he asks, so what kind of system do we need in order to do all of this? A VPN firewall can do it all. We have now completed the requirement phase. This stage may not seem too difficult, but it's an important concept because you don't want to buy the wrong system for the wrong reasons. The initiation and requirement stage clearly identifies a need for a system and what is going to be used to fulfill that need. Let's move on to the second stage, the acquisition and development phase. In most study guides, you may read that this phase is called the acquisition and development phase. 
In our case, we didn't really develop anything. We're going to acquire it, as in buy it. Buy a firewall. So we're going to call this stage planning and acquisition. Before purchasing our new system, we need to plan. And by plan, we mean answer some important questions. Remember our preliminary risk assessment? Well, this phase builds upon the preliminary risk assessment and could be known as the formal risk assessment. Before our company employees can work from home, and before the company buys a new firewall to enable them to work from home, we need to answer these four questions. Is this really what we need? Is this Cisco 55 firewall really what we need? Well, users who want to work from home need a secure connection from their home to their office network. Will this product provide that capability? The answer is yes. Not an IDS, not an IPS, not a router, but a firewall. A firewall will provide this capability. Next is something every CISP should always ask, and that's what are the risks involved? And when we talk risk, we're talking about the risk to our three security cornerstone concepts, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Remember our CISSP? Remember how she was talking about a VPN firewall properly covers confidentiality, integrity, and availability? This is what she meant. This Cisco firewall can provide confidentiality because it has the capability to implement encryption algorithms like triple DES, AES-256, and Diffie-Hellman groups. The firewall can provide integrity by providing hashing algorithms like MD5 or SHA. This firewall can also provide availability if two of the devices are purchased. By buying two, we can have them in an active-active state, meaning traffic will be concurrently going through both firewalls, or we can have them in an active standby state, where traffic is only going through one firewall and the other is standing by just in case the other one fails. With either option, if one firewall fails, the other is ready to take over. This maintains availability. Our third question is, can our company afford it? This is where ROI, return on investment, SLE, single loss expectancy, or ARO, annual rate of occurrence, can be calculated by a risk team. These calculations will provide quantitative numbers that will help management make a better decision about purchasing the firewall. The fact that bandwidth can also be saved within the company if employees work from home is also part of the company deciding if they can afford it. And most importantly, it'll make employees happy. The last question is, can we trust the vendor? Now, Cisco is already a prominent information security company used and trusted by thousands of companies around the world. So you can bet that it is extremely trusted. But to better cater the company to your own company needs, we can establish a service level agreement, just to be sure. We have now finished our planning stage and are ready to acquire the firewall. We can now move into the deployment stage. But just one more thing, for the CISP exam, you'll have to know the term due diligence and due care. What we did right here for the planning and acquisition stage is also known as doing our proper due diligence. We carefully researched and considered all risks involved before making a decision. That is the definition of due diligence. We'll talk about due care later in the video. So we've acquired our new firewall and are ready to deploy. But we can't start using it right away. There are a few more security considerations before deployment. We need a certification process. When we say certification, we aren't talking about being a CCNA or CCIE or any other Cisco certification for using the Cisco firewall. Certification in this case means to perform technical testing before deploying the firewall into a production environment. This should be done internally to make sure everything will work fine and will be compatible with systems already in place within the company. This will most likely be done by our knowledgeable CISP. The CISP will then report her certification results to the boss. The boss will ask, does this device work well with our company? And does it meet and align with our business and security objectives?
Along with certification, another term we need to know for the CSP exam is accreditation. This simply means that senior management has approved the certification process and has allowed the new system to be deployed within the company. Another thing to remember for the CSP exam is that everything requires senior management approval. We'll talk about just that topic in another video. After certification and accreditation, we can now deploy the firewall so our employees can work from home. But we're not done yet. The next phase will go over operations and maintenance of this new device. The next stage in the system's development lifecycle is operations and maintenance. The operations stage is just that, the actual operations of the newly deployed firewall. From initiation to acquisition to deployment, we are now in operational mode, with users working from home, connecting to the firewall, and accessing the company network through a virtual private network connection, or a VPN connection. Let's move on to the maintenance side. I'm a network security engineer that deals with firewalls every day for 12 hours a day, so it may seem a bit biased to say that I find the maintenance phase to be the most important stage of the system's development lifecycle. This phase involves making sure the firewall is operational not only for our users, but to also make sure the firewall is in a healthy condition. This includes things like software upgrades. Software upgrades are important in order to keep the firewall up to date and patched from the latest security vulnerabilities. There are always new emerging threats to a firewall, and constant software upgrades are required to protect from these new threats. The same goes for firmware upgrades. However, firmware upgrades occur less than software upgrades. Penetration testing is also important to make sure the company can protect and seek out any weaknesses within the firewall. Black box penetration testing is an excellent way for a company to find out any vulnerabilities that can be exploited by external threat agents. System hardening is also important. It basically means to keep tweaking and tuning the firewall to perform optimally. Think of it as turning off functions that may not be required for the firewall. It's like removing unnecessary programs in a new Windows machine. Adding access control lists or limiting certain connections are also examples of system hardening. Software upgrades, firmware upgrades, penetration testing, and system hardening should be done continuously for the life cycle of the device. This is also an example of due care. Remember how we performed our due diligence in the planning and acquisition phase? How we researched and identified all risks before making a decision to purchase a firewall? That's called doing our due diligence. Keeping up to date on software and firmware upgrades, penetration testing, and system hardening are examples of due care. So due diligence is something you do before making a decision, and due care is something you do to make sure the system you purchase is properly functioning and well maintained. Okay, so are we done? The firewall has been deployed and is being maintained? What else is there to do? Nothing for now. But there is a stage that is sometimes forgotten, and that stage answers the question, what do we do with the system once we don't need it anymore? This final phase is called disposal phase, and we'll talk about it next. One day we're no longer going to need this firewall, but we can't just throw it away in the garbage. There are proper steps to follow to prevent any security breaches even when we're done with the device. First, let's take a look at some reasons why we would be disposing the firewall. There may be a bigger and better version, like a Cisco 5585 instead of a Cisco 5505, which is what we've been using. Or maybe the company is growing in employees, and this firewall can only handle 50,000 concurrent connections when we need it to handle 500,000 concurrent connections. A bigger and better Cisco device may provide this new requirement in which case we'd have to start the system's development lifecycle all over again. Once we've established the need to dispose of the firewall, we'll want to remove the configuration that's already on the device. You don't want to throw away a firewall that has a running configuration of all your company information like IP addresses, usernames, and hashed passwords. If the configuration isn't removed, we'll be basically handing all our information to any hackers that may be dumpster diving or getting their hands on the device by any other means. As an added info, the CISP exam wants you to know that media sanitization 
and degaussing are also part of the disposal stage. This is more for backup tapes rather than firewalls though. But as it pertains to firewalls, we have a few choices. We can donate it. We can simply destroy it. But whatever we do, as a CISSP, we have an obligation to dispose of it securely and in a way that protects the environment. Thanks for watching my video about the system's development life cycle. I know it's a pretty long video, but the idea isn't to watch it once. I found that while studying for the CISP exam, it helps to refer back to notes or videos to refresh my memory on certain topics as there is a lot to cover. My CISP website and some other links are in the description below. Good luck in your studies, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your time.